morning, everyone. Thank you for coming. This is our third series of the Wellness Arthritis Series um, with Dr. Jeff Wilson. Um, today is lupus and related connective tissue disease autoimmunity. Um, so let's welcome um, Dr. Wilson once again. Thank you. Hey, I think the uh, probably the most important part of this is going to be toward the end we talk about autoimmunity. And if any of y'all have seen this issue of the AARP, nice article, page 46, really tells about this new concerns about autoimmunity, which are going to be affecting all of us more and more as time goes by. Summarizes some of the uh, uh, most recent work looking at ANA as an indicator of increased in prevalence of autoimmune diseases, um, and, uh, and one of the, peop the people that have investigated that. So we'll be talking more along those lines. The, I want you to consider, when we talk about connective tissue diseases, cognitive vascular diseases, lupus, rheumatoid, and the autoimmune rheumatologic diseases, it's really a spectrum of diseases. You've got rheumatoid arthritis at one end and lupus at the other. And in between, you've got things like Sjogren's syndrome, dermatomyositis, scleroderma. And, and you say, well, how in the world are they all related? And if you take care of people over about 35 years or so, you find out that some people will have overlapping conditions. They may not have strict, strictly rheumatoid arthritis, they may have features of lupus. We may refer to them as, as rheuma loops. Um, and people can change in that spectrum. Sometimes it'll be more, if having symptoms more typical for rheumatoid, later maybe more of lupus. And we know that Sjogren's can affect probably at least 30% of all the cases, be part of the complications. So, but they are all related. The thing that makes them related, particularly, are the antibodies, and that's indicated on your uh, second on your sheet there. Lupus has been probably related most to the ANA, the anti-nuclear antibody test, and that's something that in the past has been felt to be, you know, a very uh, sensitive test, not very specific. And it has itself several different patterns that suggest one form or, or another of uh, illness. For instance, the uh, speckled form of the ANA is typical for mixed connective tissue disease uh, and uh, that has uh, spe specific antibodies and implications as far as treatment. We'll talk about that. The, um, it has anti-DNA, a double-stranded DNA typical, again, for antibodies to active lupus. The rheumatoid we talked about last time, the patients have a rheumatoid factor and the fact that that can be positive for a lot of conditions other than rheumatoid arthritis, bacterial endocarditis, uh, and other, other diseases, syphilis, and so on, TB. The uh, inflammatory muscle diseases are things called dermatomyositis and polymyositis. They have interesting antibodies, anti jo antibody. And usually they're picked up when the patient has proximal muscle weakness and the CK is elevated. CK is, a, is not an antibody, but it's a test of muscle inflammation. And a lot of times patients are referred because if the CK is found to be elevated. And when they do that, you have to make sure that the other causes are not going on, particularly hypothyroidism will cause elevation. Sometimes just following a flu-like illness may be elevated without a lot of weakness. Um, and our, we've had in the past uh, year or so uh, patients who've had um, the dermatomyositis, elevated CKs, proximal muscle weakness. One was a neighbor out at uh, the lake and uh, noticed that she was having to be helped up and down to the doc, and she had proximal muscle weakness, dermatomyositis, and an underlying cancer causing her dermatomyositis, and uh, actually passed away with that. And years ago, probably my, the most impressive uh, early on in my career episode of an inflammatory polymyositis was a man, dermatomyositis. And, you know, we had some magnificent, what I, I'm going to call old nurses or traditional nurses, but good nurses. One was Marie Evans. It's actually the mother of the first uh, individual I was in practice with, uh, Bill Evans from Lynchburg. And one night, uh, I got called about 1.30 in the morning, and Marie Evans said, uh, Mr. So-and-so has arrested, he's dying. And I'd had him in the hospital for dermatomyositis. I'd sent him down to Duke to try to figure out anything needed to be done that I wasn't doing. I was giving him cytoxan, all kinds of medicines to try to control this autoimmune muscle disease, and nothing was working. <clears throat> and Marie Evans was one of the nurses that, if she called and said, I'm worried about this patient, you didn't say, well, what are the vital signs? What's going on? You go and put your shoes on and got to the hospital because she knew that you needed to be there. And as I got to the to the top, he was on cries at that time. 
as it came uh, up through the, through the, off the elevator, she said, uh, he's gone. He's already gone. So we went into the room, and as we were trying to go through the routine with, with coding, I was trying to intubate him. And that stimulated stuff, and he kind of coughed, coughed, and came back around. So we sent him down to the intensive care unit. His hematocrit was six. That's a little low. <laughs> it should be about 40. And he had been GI bleeding, you know, you know, probably for several days or something like that. And um, got him down to the intensive care unit, retransfused him. Then something interesting happened. His CK started to normalize. His muscle strength came back. The next thing we know, in six weeks, his medicines are down off his medicines, goes home on prednisone alone, and eventually tapered off that. So he said, what in the world? You know, what, uh, what didn't, uh, didn't Duke figure out for us? But what had we done? Basically, he had, he had done his own exchange transfusion. He had gone ahead and gotten rid of all the blood that had all the antibodies, and we replaced them with other stuff that didn't. And since then, of course, some of these patients, they do things called plasmapheresis, where they take the blood off, to try to get the antibodies out of there, and put the good blood back in there. So that was you know, always interesting patients that you run into. The, um, also, early in my career, I had um, a young lady that uh, came and called the hospital. Actually, she called the office. Her mother was concerned. She had been at UVA. Um, and told that uh, she had a condition called Sjogren's Syndrome. They also told her that uh, they needed to follow up and do a CT scan of her chest because her chest x-ray suggested may have made a mass in her lung. And, but they couldn't do the CT scan, couldn't schedule it because this was, again, in early 80s. They did not have it on every street corner. And she, they said, uh, you know, we can't do it for you here at UVA. You have to come back in two months. Um, and she said, isn't it more urgent? They said, well, don't worry, because this could be a type of cancer in your lung, you know, and it's fatal anyway. She had had, uh, I think, had, had her first child at that time, and a very, very intelligent uh, woman. And her mother had, had heard me speak at one of the uh, conferences and had me take a look at her. And it ends up that she, she had Sjogren's. And probably over the next um, six months, we went back and forth with the idea of where we were going to open her chest to take out a tumor that might be related to her Sjogren's syndrome uh, or watch it. And Jen C. Teague followed along, Bill's old partner and per person who many of you knew, so smart on his, his uh, uh, clinical acumen. We never did end up operating on her. Uh, and uh, she did, I'd say, you know, rather well with her Sjogren's. In medicine, you're always concerned about how does a disease affect a patient. And occasionally, you, you get you know, delighted to find out how a patient affects the disease. And uh, she became the president of the Sjogren's Foundation, has worked for them ever since, very pre prominent uh, and preeminent as far as handling their scientific research. If you, if you say, you know, I need information on Sjogren's in Lynchburg, uh, you go to her first, then Ida second, and maybe me third on, on the list. Um, interesting folks. Scleroderma is, um, is a, a dreaded disease, I think. Uh, now, it has some different variants, but it's, when it gets into lung problems, pulmonary problems, uh, it can be very, very difficult to take care of. And Sir William Osler, who was a grand old man of medicine, 1895, 1918 times, real introduced of clinical medicine, he said that when the arthritis patient came in the front door of your office, what you should do is go out the back door because ah. it was so hard to treat them. They were always, you know, chronic complaints and, and problems and so on. And, uh, and certainly we advanced much further from that. But I will tell you, there's still uh, a, a feeling with scleroderma that maybe you want to go out the back door because it can be a very difficult, difficult disease and fatal disease. Mixed connective tissue disease. One of our one of our folks here, you know, was taking care of a duke with that in the past. And, uh, and matter of fact, one of her main treat, uh, uh, people that treated her was David Caldwell, who was someone that taught me a lot of my uh, rheumatology. The thing that was interesting about mixed connective tissue disease was uh, about my third month in practice, or fourth month in practice, Harold Riley, wonderful Harold Riley, called and said, I have this patient. I think maybe something's going on that's autoimmune. Interesting. And I saw this girl that was about 16 or 17 years old. And when she came in, uh, her parents, uh, the first question they said to me, they said, what do you know about vitamin G? 
I said, geez, I just finished you know, training at a pretty good place. I don't know anything about vitamin G. And she was seeing a, a vitamin, vitaminologist in Florida. She was on 60 vitamin pills. And uh, she ends up, she had mixed connective tissue disease, which is, has elements of vasculitis, muscle dermatomyositis, lupus, scleroderm, all sort of things together. And, and the main treatment for that is prednisone. So the vitaminologist not only had her on 60 vitamin pills a day, but they, said, they told her one thing for sure, don't ever let anybody put you on prednisone. And so here I, <laughs> here I am about three months into practice, I said, you know what I'd like to give you is prednisone. Well, we wanted to um, get a, a biopsy to kind of sort of figure this out exactly. Her family, of course, were Jehovah's Witnesses. And I said, you know, I'm going to put her on prednisone, have her in the hospital get a biopsy. She'll have the stress of this stuff going on. She'll have a GI bleed. I can't transfuse her. I'm going to have one of the shortest practices ever in Lynchburg history. Uh, we put her in there. And uh, Tim Sylvester, we all had uh, come to Lynchburg the same day, starting in practice, uh, was on call. And he did a biopsy. And later on, he, he, he said, I'm going to always save some of that tissue. Whenever we're having biopsies that aren't showing much, I'm just going to throw some of this tissue in. Because indeed, it showed vasculitis, muscle inflammation, scleroderma changes, everything in one biopsy. Well, when I, when I got her to go ahead and take on prednisone, it was very low doses of prednisone. I mean, five milligrams twice a day. She came back in two weeks, said that for the first time in about two or three years, she felt normal. CK came down, everything evolved, she just looked wonderful. Then her family moved to Winston-Salem and had her set up to see uh, John Wolfe, who the rheumatologist trained ahead of me, uh, and, and follow up with him. She was doing so well, did not see her for two or three years. Uh, she came back and, and now all of a sudden was having terrible inflammatory arthritis problems uh, and all sorts of things. When they got to Winston-Salem, instead of seeing the rheumatologist, they saw uh, went back to not a vitaminologist but a water doctor clear things out by watering through your system and washing your system out and so on and stop the prednisone um, and after two or three years we really never were able to get back on top of this again she progressed into a fatal form of scleroderma so you know you learn things continue to learn things um, if you take a look at, at lupus lupus is a disease of protein manifestations and as far as treatments, particularly for systemic lupus, it depends on part of the, part of the system that's, in, that's involved. For instance, lupus patients, like almost all the patients with the, uh, in the spectrum of connective tissue diseases, these autoimmune diseases, all of them may initially present with a symmetrical polyarthritis of the hands, just exactly like rheumatoid. And yet, they're, they're, they're going ahead to, on to evolve things. So the initial presentation somebody has you know, may not be giving you the definite diagnosis over time and, uh, and following therapies, it'll tell. So a lot of patients with, with uh, lupus will start off with maybe medicines like uh, some non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, um, naproxen or something like that. That's all they need as far as the arthritis. There's one thing that was of interest. A lot of patients found that with Motrin and ibuprofen, that more patients with lupus for some reason had I think called aseptic meningitis, inflammation in the meninges of the brain and, and uh, like a meningitis. Didn't seem to be the common with some of the other diseases. So every medicine always has a few side effects that are unusual. The patients had uh, often had nasopharyngeal sores. In the first uh, uh, talk we had, we're talking about the uh, review of systems and the ones that make you think about lupus for the other diseases. Nasopharyngeal sores, uh, ulcers and so on, they respond to nasal steroids. But they're the first thing that we really we, we get the patients interested in with plaque when they'll seem to be helpful for these, these nasopharyngeal sores. Serositis, one of the features of lupus, inflammation around the lungs, pleurisy, pleural effusions around the heart, pericarditis. And these patients, when they flare up, often have to have a prednisone taper for that. Renal disease is the one that uh, really need the nephrologist to help out with lupus. And they end up on, on all kinds of medicines, but cytoxan, uh, one called methylphenolate, azathioprine, all of these things in different patients may be indicated. And that can be a, a very difficult problem. Usually saw that in our young black females. And uh, in, in my initial years of practice, I had uh, some wonderful uh, young uh, black females that had 
Lucas, very typical presentations. And um, one of them I remember, C.C. Glass, she was, a bit, was active in their, all their activities and stuff, a great little singer. Um, and, and Pam, uh, like a lot of the, the uh, teenagers, I guess he was 16 or 17, she knew everything, which was, was handy, and, uh, and did not mind telling her doctor about some of that stuff. So one night I had her in the hospital, and, uh, and she was young, getting into sexual activity and so on, and she had an infection, wanted to give her IV antibiotics. So I had her in the hospital, and um, I got called about uh, 9.30 one night. I wasn't supposed to be on call, but the service came right through to me and said, call so-so, 4A, that's for general, called. They'd run, her IV had, fin had run out, and the IV nurses couldn't, couldn't find an IV. Boy, when they couldn't find them, I was in trouble because I knew I probably wouldn't be able to find a vein either. But I thought, well, I'm going to go in. She's my patient. I'm going to take care of her. So I went in there, and and I had them before I got there. Go ahead and wrap the arms, you know, in nice warm wet soaks to get gets the veins to stand up. Good trick. Didn't work, but a good idea. So I got there, and I mean, we must have gone through oh eight or nine sticks trying to get an IV going, and uh, it was it was becoming punitive. So uh, I finally I said, you know, we're just going to have to stop it. We just have to try to give it IM and hope that will take care of the antibiotics IM. Went home and they were continuing to wrap her arms through the night. Came in the next morning of rounds. Pam was, was Pam and had survived the night, <laughs> all bruised up and so on. She said, you know, Dr. Wilson, last night when you came in the hospital, I thought, boy, she's going to, you know, say how much she appreciated me coming to take care of her. She looked at me and she said, you didn't know what you were doing, did you? I said, I said, you're right, Pam. I said, the next time you have that problem, I said, don't let them call me. Call someone who knows what they're doing. Um, and usually your young patients with uh, scleroderma or with lupus are the ones that, uh, when they die and have increased mortality, it's from infections. And I had a lovely young girl that uh, ended up with a flesh-eating bacteria, but this flesh-eating was pseudomonas on her leg, lost her leg, that was amputated, uh, uh, and then somehow or other, you know, added in a, you know, pregnancy and, and all these other complications and, and, and died young. Um, when, when patients, uh, when you're looked at with uh, some of the elements of their inflammatory system, we look at things called complement as, as part of that. And we know that people who have deficiencies of complement, early, early complement components like C1, 2, 3, and 4, may have increased tendency to these autoimmune diseases. Some of these girls had that. Uh, others have deficiencies at C8 and 9, later parts. They have increased infections, gonorrhea and, and infections like that. Um, so you're always sort of balancing these, these different people. But as far as the overall treatment with lupus, one thing's for sure, and that is Michelle Petrie, who is probably the guru of, of lupus in our country, she loves Plaquenil. She hates prednisone, but she loves Plaquenil. They feel like Plaquenil is like a daily multivitamin that should be taken every day for patients with connective tissue diseases with lupus. Plaquenil was found in World War II as a derivative of the anti-malarial medicine chloroquine. It's hydroxychloroquine. And it was good for arthritis. So they started to find it helpful with these different forms of arthritis, often used as one of the initial treatments for rheumatoid or any of the inflammatory arthritic disorders. Problem being that it could cause eye toxicity. So you had to watch the eyes very carefully with frequent examinations. And the eye doctors, if you, if you know you're going to your eye doctor, they always have a new gadget. And, uh, and they found more and more sensitive tests for eye problems. And they thought, well, with any kind of early sensitive change, maybe we need to tell them to stop the Plaquenil. And they would, they would tell, like Michelle Petrie's patients, one time, stop the Plaquenil. And when she showed up uh, at Michelle Petrie's office for follow-up, she found out what the eye doctor did. The eye doctor got an immediate re uh, return on his uh, input. And she has the, the background and the clout to, uh, to make him really uncomfortable. Sort of like, don't you ever stop any of my patients until I see them and I decide. Uh, and it was an easy thing to do. The eye doctor said, you know, I'm concerned about the plaque mill, worried about your vision. You better stop the vision. Well, what are you going to do? And, then, and, and they said, well, what am I going to do about medicine? Well, go see your rheumatologist. So they have tied one arm behind your back and said, you know, good luck and take care of that. Not fair. The reason she hates prednisone is the patients who've been on prednisone were the ones who um, had increased mortality, 
uh, at, at a younger age and so on. Part of the increased mortality in this, this disease, but like all the related diseases, all the other diseases in that spectrum, is continued inflammation. They have increased incidence of lymphomas and tumors early on as, as time goes by. One of the interesting things for in practice is when you start to see atypical presentations of things. If you've seen enough patients, you just say, boy, this is unusual. And probably in the early 80s to mid 80s, I saw four patients who were very unusual uh, with lupus. Well, three with lupus, one with Sjogren's. Unusual because they're all white. Three of the four were male, and they all died. So very unusual things. And they had one thing in common. They'd all been in Vietnam and had Agent Orange exposure. During that time, and years later on, Agent Orange was at least linked to lymphomas. And I had a friend who's a rheumatologist in the VA system. And I called and I said, this would be an important thing to find out. Let's see you know, how many of these things are related to Agent Orange. And you know, it's one of those investigations that somehow with, no, with the uh, government didn't go very far. Didn't get much follow-up on that, but I'm, I'm sure that it existed and was a problem. The, um, one of the patients I had, wonderful young man, a carpenter, uh, and uh, supporting and taking care of his family, and he had a flare-up one weekend, maybe from being out in the sun. Sun is one of the things you avoid with connective tissue and lupus. Makes these things flare up, breaks down a lot of DNA, and it gets in your system. You react against it. And one weekend, uh, I switched call. I was covered by an internist and uh, the GI doctors were all covering each other together. And they called, and, and he was uh, just feeling poorly, and was seen uh, at uh, Virginia Baptist. He had a, a lot of red cells in his, in his urine. He was on cytoxan for for his lupus. And that can be a side effect of the medicine. So, he, so the person who's covering said, well, you probably need to stop the cytoxan. Well, probably he needed a prednisone boost, maybe more cytoxan, because it's hard to tell when was the inflammatory disease flaring up, or when were you having a reaction to a medicine, or when were you having an infection on top of it all. So you try to balance these things. He went to uh, UVA the next day. His wife's very smart. And uh, I took him to UVA. She. Um, had him, had him put on the, on the ward. As the evening went on, he seemed to get worse as far as his breathing, more trouble breathing. And she alerted the ward resident and interns. They were very busy. He said, look, he's been evaluated. You know, he's fine. You know, you're a hysterical wife. You know, should deal with it. And said so about two or three hours later, he arrested, ended up in the intensive care unit and died. I got called the next morning. I had, uh, hadn't seen them. Uh, but Bill O'Brien, who was the uh, rheumatologist who was on call at that time. And he said, he said, you know, for the first time in probably 15 years, I had to go in the middle of the night for a rheumatology consult on one of your patients. And um, what had happened, he had developed, again, here's an unusual patient to have lupus. He had an unusual problem, pulmonary hemorrhage, uh, which occurs in a certain number of the lupus patients. And he died with that. Um, interestingly, his, his wife came to the office the next day my girls are very savvy. We, we like them, like the whole family. Worked them right in. Talked to her about 45 minutes. Very difficult to do. She lost her family and so on. But, um, you know, that's this is sort of part of the total care that you try to give and handle these chronic problems. Another patient we had in this group was a female nurse who uh, uh, had exposure to the uh, Gentlemen, the, the patients and so on in Vietnam with, with Agent Orange uh, taking care of them. Interesting, she had a sister that took, was taking care of at the same time with rheumatoid. Uh, and a lot of times you'll find in families one person will have lupus, one will have rheumatoid, one will have something else. The other patient I had from here, uh, likewise, uh, his, uh, his uh, niece, or rather his cousin, had dermatomyositis, polymyositis, took care of her at the same time. And Tom, uh, who had been in one of the Agent Orange exposures patients, um, ended up very early on having had hip replacements. Unusual. Uh, sometimes he was on prednisone. Sometimes prednisone makes aseptic necrosis occur, makes it more likely to have a, a need, needing hip replacements. He had them. And he later on ended up in the VA hospital 
and he had a very unusual lymphoma and died with that unusual lymphoma. All these things I felt Agent Orange related. And later on, I found out his daughter developed lupus. So, you know, all these sort of things, the, the interesting history, the way things interrelate, you know, are, are so important to take note of. We talk about diseases that have protean manifestations, and that is just all kinds of different manifestations, and lupus certainly is one. And people say, you know, if you uh, really understand lupus, you'll understand all of medicine. Uh, and they used to say that about uh, one other uh, uh, illness. And uh, Dr. Crow, you may remember this. Which one did they save? Exactly. And, um, and I, was, I knew if Bill wasn't here, that I was going to see if Janet Hickman was, because it used to be the departments of dermatology were, it was called dermatology and syphilology. Nice. And, uh, and they really handled that using arsenic and all kinds of things, very interesting. Uh, and it, it occurred so many things, three different types of forms of syphilis. Well, then lupus was the same sort of thing. You know, the patients had protean manifestations, and if you understood that, or sarcoidosis, all these different diseases that may have protean manifestations, you knew all kinds of medicine. You mentioned the familial associations. One of my patients, who was a wonderful lady that had uh, pretty significant rheumatoid, all kinds, very deforming rheumatoid. Had been a, a very successful worker for years at, uh, at, uh, at one of insurance companies. And her, her sister, she was concerned about because her sister had lupus. Her sister died with lupus inflammation of the brain, cerebritis. And my patient continued to be concerned, are you sure I don't have lupus? Are you sure I don't have lupus? Well, then lo and behold, she did have a positive ANA. And she, she, that was found out, you know, one time she came back and said, I thought you said I didn't have lupus. She didn't have it, didn't have a balance, but it had worried her to death. And those interrelation, interrelated diseases, we just saw patient to patient. If you look at your next page, very typical thing with a, with a young patient to present with the uh, skin rash changes. And the, the malar rash across, across here is what's called the, the wolf bite. That was where lupus comes from. And there's a, there is a term, you know, that uh, you know, if the, the strength of the wolf is in the pack and the strength of the pack is in the wolf. And lupus, if you notice the, the sparing around her face and nose area, the differential for rashes like that are rosacea. And rosacea doesn't spare those, so they'll be red in all those whole areas. And these people often respond to uh, plaque widow, again, responding nicely to that. You'll notice on her palm, she has this redness, very typical for connective tissue diseases, but palm erythema is probably somebody here has some palm erythema. Runs in families, maybe related to thyroid disease. And they talk about lupus hair, which you can see on the top of her scalp there. These little stubbly, stubble like hairs that, that develop, again, with the act of lupus, and will get better with disease of the uh, lupus, disease of control. The next page is, shows a patient with dermatomyositis, and the picture across the top, they wake up and sort of have maybe puffiness and a violaceous change of color across the, uh, the nose, the, the bridge and the eyes, called a heliotrope. And again, you see that, you want to make sure the thyroid's okay, and make sure the CK is normal. And then you look at the hands, and these, these rashes that you see here are, are called Gottron's patches, Gottron's patches are typical for dermatomyositis. <clears throat> but I had a, a, a young black girl that uh, had no weakness in her, in, her, in, her, in her bones or joints, had a little bit elevated CK. It's actually a muscle, you know, uh, worked out all the time. And, and she had Gottron's, but no abnormalities in her, in her uh, muscle disease, controlled easily with, with Plaquenil. She had all kinds of variants. One of the, the mother of my first patient with uh, alpha-gal, who I've mentioned here before, um, who was from here at Westminster Canterbury, she had this as part of this. We thought, well, you know, does she have connective tissue disease? Does she have kind of a presentation of psoriasis? And that was just part of her um, alpha-gal skin disease, skin manifestations of alpha-gal. And you remember, alpha-gal is, is sort of very interesting. Um, because it relates to so many different things. We see it more and more, and we're going to explain why. We're going to talk about autoimmunity. Um, 
a few things that, that excite the rheumatologist, autoimmunity is one. Did you ever run into a, a phrase or something and say, boy, I wish I had said that? Well, here you see this guy, Rick Bacala, who's head of rheumatology at Yale, uh, made this comment, the prevailing paradigm for autoimmunity is founded on the lifetime interplay between genetic susceptibility and acquired environmental exposures. Wow, I wish I had said that. I believe it. And, and, and what, he, what he's saying is, is that the model for autoimmunity, and look at the thing, lifetime interplay. So guess what? It sort of reaffirms what we said for forever, that if all of us live long enough, we're probably all going to have rheumatoid factors, probably all going to have ANAs. Your immune system is continually being hit on, you know, triggered, and sometimes it's going to respond by making these. may not have the disease, realness, but you'll have the ANA. And the thing that's, that started this uh, article, he did a, uh, a lovely editorial. He's the vice editor for Arthritis and Rheumatism, our main journal. And in there, he was talking about the increasing prevalence of autoimmune diseases, which is measured by the increasing incidence of ANAs, the ANA test. And you know, I, I can't tell you how often you would be, you'd be uh, consulted in rheumatology, positive with a positive ANA, do they have lupus? And you were always weighing all the various criteria that most of the time didn't have it. And your response was, it's a sensitive test, really may not mean, mean anything. And I think we were wrong. And this suggests that it probably does have some pathogenic potential the test be an anti-nuclear antibody. Think about it. Antibodies to your nucleus, you know, every cell in your body, you know, antibodies that are reacting against it can't be too good. Um, and so the, and with the other antibodies we're looking at, you're showing, you know, showing up as other parts of the connective tissue diseases. Anyway, when I read uh, his editorial in there, he mentions that one of the things that's one of the triggers, environmental triggers, for um, uh, some of these autoimmune diseases is the alpha-gal. I thought, well, that's fascinating. So anyway, I just sent him a little note. I said, I read with interest your editorial note, the article on increased prevalence of ANA. June 26th, this is a note uh, that I sent to him June 30th of uh, 2020. I said, on June, June 26th, as part of my free clinic rheumatology practice, I saw a 51-year-old white female referred for evaluation of positive ANA with a low titer RMP, ribonuclear protein. She, didn't, she had polyarthralgias no muscle weakness, normal CK, et cetera. This rheumatology talk that the fact she didn't have obvious inflammatory rheumatologic disease. But her, her alpha-gal test was positive, And she was instructed in a mammalian meat-restricted diet. And I mentioned to him that uh, Central Virginia has really been the epicenter of alpha-gal disease, as you all know. And that uh, we'd had an abstract presented on the basis of my 145 patients. I had my last 15 months of practice. And, uh, and sent him the, the information that I had, had written about that, um, and also uh, a part of a chapter from uh, a book I had done about my patients, things we'd locked, called Your Father Took Care of My Mother, showing the inherited tendency for some of these diseases. I said, I thought these, these might be of interest to you. So this was June 30th of 2020. And um, most of the time when you send in, you know, for the, the clinical doctor out there in practice to the academics, hear nothing. I thought, okay, um, but instead I got uh, this, this note from, uh, from uh, Dr. Bacala, and uh, he said that what had happened was on October of 2020, four or five months late after my initial note, you know, he, he read it and, uh, and, and got sort of interested in it. And, uh, he said so much. He said so much for the vagaries of institutional mail delivery during COVID-19. He was coming in the office no more than once a week, but he took the information and sent it around to some of his friends, who had had uh, you know more experience, and he was really impressed about the the nature of the autoimmunity that was suggested by the alpha gal. So this had a sort of sort of thinking again about how these things interconnect. And remember, autoimmune diseases now are almost every subspecialty has an autoimmune disease. Uh, myasthenia gravis, MS in neurology, all the thyroid diseases, autoimmune, remember the th most common cause of low thyroid is Hashimoto's, autoimmune thyroiditis, inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, celiac disease, alpha-gal, Addison's disease, usually from antibodies affecting the adrenal glands, and all the connective tissue diseases. So with that in mind, 
I wanted to take a look at, at uh, some different diseases and models of this that may be on, ongoing. One of the most classic um, stories in rheumatology along these lines uh, started in about 1962. And Jim Hunter was uh, stationed at Portsmouth at this time when the, the uh, battleship that was out at sea, they, uh, the uh, sailors, about 1,200 of them, uh, got a case of Shigella dysentery. Typical, you know, the diarrhea went through, you know, a large number of them. In two or three days, you know, everyone was doing better, even without antibiotics. But there were about 10 of them who started to have a persistent inflammation, thing called Reiter's syndrome, where they had arthritis, inflammation of the eyes, inflammation of the urinary tract, and it persisted. So here was a nice example of where an infection triggered off an autoimmune disease. And for, for a long time, we certainly believed that probably the most common one everyone knew about before was rheumatic fever. Strep throat in some people ends up causing rheumatic heart disease and rheumatic fever. Well, these patients, uh, when the, about this was about 1962-64. They were beginning at the end of the 60s on into the 70s and then particularly in the 80s to do HLA testing for transplantation. And the HLA histocompatibility complex have, may have things A, B, C, and D. And uh, if you're, say, A1, B2, C3, D4, and someone else that you need a kidney from is the same, you're a match. Most likely would be no resistance, no rejection of the, with the match. So as they begin to, to develop uh, information and, and data on this, they found out that the HLA B27 test was present in only about 4 to 7% of the normal population. But if you took a look at people with spondyloarthropathies, a type of inflammatory arthritis affecting up and down the spine, ankylosing spondylitis, Maurice Strumpel's uh, arthritis, uh, the spondyloarthropathy, the psoriatic arthritis, the Ryder syndrome, about 90% 90, 90 of them were positive for this. So here we had a marker that suggested people really had a terrific susceptibility. It was triggered off by an infection that caused this chronic inflammatory disorder. So now we're, we're having that model autoimmune. And the question was, can you predict these things? If you can, can you start to prevent them? And you have on your uh, little handout, though, showing some of the things we looked at as far as uh, inherited genetics. The people that, uh, that were, uh, that, that uh, I say that Jim Hunter was at Portsmouth, and these people went out and got this information about in the 70, about 75 or 76, um, Andrew, Andrew Kalin and then Jim Freeze went back and hunted these individuals down. The nice thing about the military was they always had records. It kind of kept them, you know, somewhere. And uh, they, they found and tracked down all these people. And, and all of them were B27 positive. So the ones who had developed this chronic inflammatory process triggered off by this had had an increased susceptibility that was, that was, that was picked out by the uh, infection. You know, a lot of times we talk about inherited genetics. I think the, um, the tendency is to think, you know, well, genetics are always bad. What's in your family? Gosh, you know, we've got heart disease, we've got uh, Huntington's, you know, we've got uh, high cholesterol, we've got strokes, hypertension, and so on. And I have to remember also that probably I always say genetics are also good. You know, you might say, well, maybe it's your good genetics that, you know, made you so beautiful and so smart. They may not always be bad things. There's probably good things come with the genes as well. Now, now, how to sort out the, uh, the bad things. If you take a look at the HLA B27 story, and what is the, um, what's our census population in the U.S. this time? If, a lot. I think, I think I, it was about 325 million. Does that sound right? I did the calculations on 325 million, give or take a million. And, um, if 4 to 7 percent of the patients have the HLA B27, that means there's 16.25 million people that have this susceptibility to develop maybe this Ryder syndrome or any of these other spondyloarthropathies. They found out that if you took a look at people who came in uh, to donate blood and they checked the HLA, those that were B27 positive that were donating blood had, had no 
uh, signs or symptoms of any type of inflammatory diseases, no problems at all, that, uh, that only 20% of them later on seem to develop a spondyloarthropathy. So that ended up being 3.25 million. Now, what do you know about alpha-gal? What's the susceptibility for alpha-gal? How many of our, huh? Depends on where you live. Well, but, well, but the susceptibility is 100%. You know, all of us, you know, are, you know, have you know, the alpha gal, you know, don't have it. So, so we all, you know, potentially have that susceptibility. That's pretty interesting. Well, why in the world are we seeing alpha gal more and more then? So we have a tremendously susceptible, just like our susceptibility for COVID. As it, as people are getting more and more uh, alpha gal, we're seeing the increasing territoriality and range of lone star tick. Coming up and up further and further, uh, and more and more deer to help carry the tick along, right? Um, so, it's, you know, to me, it's not—it's no surprise. I mean, I haven't—I can't think of anybody the last couple of years that uh, I've seen that ever know about had Lyme. Loads of people with alpha gal, so something that makes sense there. So, you know, the inherited susceptibility was they, they had a gene deletion, so they did not make alpha gal. We had that listed there on, on your inherited genetics. So here their inherited susceptibilities unexpressed. So we've got there. So what triggers them? And we look at direct and indirect triggers, and we're quite uh, comfortable with the idea of infectious things that trigger off these diseases. The Shigella triggered off the Ryder syndrome. COVID-19, obviously, is a direct trigger, triggering off a lot of problems. It's very interesting if you take a look at uh, when they started to come out with pictures of some of the skin lesions uh, on the COVID patients. And then you had seeing young people that were that were losing limbs and dying because of thrombo thromboses. He said, "Boy, it really looks like uh, the antiphospholipid antibody syndrome in lupus patients." And indeed, now it looks like a lot of these patients have these these sort of antibodies that would they would that would develop also with lupus. Um, all these sort of things, you know, you know, kind of interconnected. And the reason it's important to see interconnections is maybe because it's an idea about treating to prevent disease, predict and prevent. We can predict predict a lot of these people are going to be in problems. How can we prevent it? The most typical thing in uh, COVID-19 is that it's in the center part of your, your handout there where they found by the genome-wide association studies that, that a certain uh, group of the people were having increased tendency to severe COVID. And these were people that were type A blood group and uh, the, had the genetic locus, this 3P21.31, multi-gene locus. So the people that had that combination, they're the ones that you say, boy, they're going to really have trouble. So what do we do? Well, certainly vaccinate them. You know, these are people that, that just like everybody should be vaccinated more and more as the day goes by. But anyway, certainly they should have that to try to prevent it from occurring. But if they did, you early on wanted these folks to get dexamethasone and plasma monoclonal antibodies. Um, and, but you know, again, in addition to the vaccination, the mask and all that, the um, quarantine and so everything you could do to prevent it. Uh, I just recently had a friend of mine, he and his wife in Kentucky, an under-vaccinated state, got the uh, Delta variant. They'd both been vaccinated. Both of them got antibodies, thank goodness, and, and survived it. But uh, they were they're feeling pretty rough. And I think we all sort of worry about that. So I must say that the, the uh, next time that the booster comes available here, sign me up. And you know, I had worked uh, doing the, the vaccination. See there, volunteer vac vaccinator uh, out of uh, TJ Maxx. Um, and recently, I was called to see if I wanted to go out to Amherst uh, this past week or so. We were having such a problem. To tell you the truth, uh, you know, I, I, it didn't quite suit my schedule. The more I thought about it, I'm not sure that this is such an infectious agent. I didn't think I would be maybe doing a, a, a service to WC if I brought it back with me. So I didn't go and do that, and I was so I'm hesitant. If I get a, if I get uh, a booster, maybe I'll go ahead and start uh, volunteering to do the vaccinations again. So the COVID-19 and the alpha gal. Well, with the alpha gal, if we can predict that everybody is, is going to be have a, have a chance to get this, tick avoidance is obvious. So direct direct problems, direct triggers. We, we take a look at that. probably the most important indirect trigger is global warming. 
in global warming, that's what has allowed us in the last few years to see this you know, increase of Zika infection, uh, some other unusual uh, chikungunya, which is another viral arthritic type condition, more and more frequent um, you know, with global warming. It's global warming, it, you see the territory again increasing and range increasing for the uh, ticks and all. Um, so predict and prevent is, is the, name of, the name of the game. And that's what kind of, kind of kills me as a physician to seeing the ability to predict what's, what's happening you know, with the Delta variant and not having the people get it prevented by getting vaccinated. Uh, just uh, anti-vaccination for anything other than a real medical reason uh, is, is hard for me to uh, accept. What's going to happen in the future? And I think one thing that's going to happen is, where is the, when the infant is born, they're going to all have, a, have their genome checked. They're going to have the whole outline. They're going to say, you know, this uh, you know, little uh, Jeffrey the 15th here, has, uh, you know, he's got all these, these things where we know if he gets you know, the Shigella or if he gets the COVID or if he gets this sort of thing, this, that, or the other, you know, it's going to be a problem. We're going to, he's going to be uh, treated with this panel of vaccination. Vaccination, the other people, according to their uh, genome, will have different things to be vaccinated. He's going to need to, you know, avoid, you know, you know different uh, things, sun exposure. Uh, we know that his vitamin D is going to help keep him strong even then uh, to, to, you know, avoid having these immune things triggered off. In addition, they're going to take some of the umbilical stem cells, I think, from each individual and save those so that, uh, you know, when Jeffrey the 15th needs a kidney transplant, you know, 45 years ago, they're going to grow it from his own stem cell. Isn't that interesting in the possibility? Um, so it's sort of the brave new world. Um, and right now, I think we need to get through the brave present world with this crazy pandemic, don't we? Um, and I'm going to just open this for, you know, for questions. Autoimmunity, beautiful summary of it right here. It talks about the, the ANA test as a, as a sign, increase in ANA of the of increase in prevalence of autoimmunity was done by Frederick Miller, his group. He's been, he's been doing incredible research for years and years. And the thing that was interesting is that if you take a look at the different things going from like 11 or 12 percent, two years later, you know, 14 percent, whatever. And then his, his uh, study, I have a copy of the paper, ended about two years before my practice ended in my 146 patients. When I looked at their ANAs, it was up to about 18 percent. So we're seeing this increased prevalence of these tests, which mean increasing autoimmune disease. And that's what we just need to be aware of. The other question, a lot of, many of you, I'm sure, have had an ANA test at one time or another that said, gee, it's positive. Don't worry about that. One thing that I would be doing to, I think, again, to prevent disease, if someone has an ANA test, and say, if have Raynaud's phenomenon, two things that make me think more about connective tissue diseases. In the last year or two of practice, a lot of these patients, I put on Plaquenil and the vitamin D. And a lot of times, the ANA test in a year or so came back negative. And the test is very sensitive. It's negative, it's very specific. And I think that probably using that medicine and then we could taper off of that, I think we probably were really preventing some disease. We predicted it, we think we do things to prevent it. Incidentally, the Plaquenil story, Plaquenil now is, can be looked at with blood studies, blood levels, so you can monitor a lot easier instead of having the eyes checked, doing both. That's all I know. So I'm going to open up for questions. Everything should be just simple and clear as a bell. <laughs> Avoiding sun exposure, I had a friend who had lupus and she eventually passed away, but she always wore a hat, long sleeves and stuff, because we used to go out in the woods and we were tick magnets uh, hunting down native orchids. Um, I was never told that I have Crest, HHT, Alpha Gal, and I've had Raynos. Should I be avoiding the sun too? Yes. Okay. <laughs> and, and you know, because the, no one's ever told me that. I mean, I, I do have a rheumatologist, but he never. The, uh, and I, even some of the ultraviolet, you know, stuff in shops, can, some people are sensitive to that. Oh, I don't. So you know, and if you've noticed something like that, 
and this, when we talk about sun sensitivity, it's not, oh, I've got a bad burn, I burn easy. No, it's, I really feel sick after being in the sun. No, I've, so. I've done that since I was a kid. I felt, I never could lay in the sun. And I remember, always, remember from our talk about vitamin D, the, the one good thing that, you know, that uh, the sun did was to get your vitamin D up. As you got older, you still could cause skin cancers, but it, your skin stopped making vitamin D for some reason. Most common cause of low vitamin D. So, yeah, avoid the sun. And you're nice and pale, I guess. Thank you. I don't sit in it. I think I, I've got liver disease now. I don't know. I'm just As you said, the anti-nuclear antibody test is not really specific for lupus, but a lot of times we would have patients come in with nonspecific symptoms. We would suspect they might have an autoimmune disease of some kind, and we didn't want to get all these tests, you know, at once, and we would obtain an anti-nuclear antibody. If it was positive, we think, well, maybe there is an autoimmune disease of some kind. We really need to pursue this. If the anti-nuclear antibody test is negative, is that pretty good at ruling out lupus or autoimmune disease in general? Yeah, it really is. And, and, and the thing I'm interested in is if somebody that is definitely ANA positive and can become negative in two years on Plaquenil and, and vitamin D, are you preventing disease? I'm not going to know the answer to some of these things. I don't think to, uh, uh, it's my definition of heaven is to get all this knowledge. <laughs> I think he's going to say, well, you did right there. Well, you missed that one. You know, this was good. That was bad. So get the uh, medical judgment. Very good. Thank you. Um, I know there's probably not a definite answer, but a range of maybe of how long after the exposure to the Agent Orange, do people generally have? Uh, it, it's it's not right away, obviously, because you said you were in working in the 80s and this happened in the 70s or 60s. So. Yeah. So it takes a while, right? Yeah, eight to ten years. The uh, there's a nurse that uh, did a book, and and talked about her experiences with it, and then um, all kinds of um, congenital problems with with offspring later on. So probably Agent Orange was causing a, a through methylation change in the DNA, which actually passed on, and uh, and so it was so interesting that Tom's daughter ended up having lupus. Mm. Doesn't surprise me, and so and so I think in any when I'm doing history, I'm always interested in other family members who you know had other connective tissue diseases or other autoimmune diseases. Gee, the number of uh, patients who had B12 deficiency, you know, much more an autoimmune basis now with connective tissue disease is just incredible. And, it, and you know, as Ida knows, Sjogren syndrome, to me, is like the number one thing. They have, those people have antibodies to everything. Some of them, it's just incredible. May not have clinical symptoms, but they have the, the potential there. Yeah, I lived on Fort Devens, and apparently they closed that down in, in Massachusetts. And I believe the high school was closed down because of asbestos. So I'm wondering if asbestos has a lot to do with how, you know, if that affects autoimmune, you know, causes anything, or and how does that work? Well, yeah, of course, obviously, there's such an association with mesothelioma and all kinds of lung cancer, um, you know, with the asbestos. I don't know whether it's a bit of an irritant or uh, you know, perhaps up as an effect on the immune system. You know, right now, there's the idea of cancer immun immunotherapy. We're going to mention that in our next final part of the series. Cancer immunotherapy right now is a, is a, is a great thing. Uh, and what it says is that the people have different, what they call checkpoints. And these, these areas, the immune system is not uh, acting up, uh, doing enough to control and, and work against cancers that appear. So they have these checkpoint inhibitors. The immunotherapy goes and inhibits the, uh, the, the checkpoint thing, which is, is suppressing the immune system. So it releases the immune system to go after the cancer. And it seems very, very effective. Well, guess what? When you release the immune system, guess what else it does? Pneumonitis, arthritis, hepatitis, you know, colitis, every inflammation. It's like the hyperimmune response. And that's where we learn about COVID. 
that was one of the relationships thing about COVID. You know, something this hyperimmune response, hyperinflammatory response, may not be good in some cases. But what a trade-off! And and uh, you know, we know a fellow who recently passed away, but I mean, he just did beautifully for four or five years with immunotherapy. Another one of those new things. Our 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 immune uh, immunology at uh, when I was a freshman at Duke or at med school, first year of med school. And the guy summed it up saying, well, he said, you know, immune system is surveillance, looks around and sees this bacteria. And it says, you know, boy, that bacteria is foreign. I don't like that. And what it does, it produces an antibody and beats the hell out of the bacteria. Well, that was pretty simple. After that, things have got a lot more complicated with the immune system. You were mentioning that celiac is uh, an autoimmune type uh, disease. And that, that, what is it, Flacosil and vitamin D, would you think that would be good for taking if you have celiac? Probably. Yeah. So the Flacosil has to be prescribed by a physician? Well, usually the celiac is so controlled well, you know, with diet, watching the, the antibodies, but definitely, definitely the vitamin D, I would definitely do that. I didn't, didn't treat anybody with the Plaquenil. If, well, let's see, if I had a celiac patient and a positive ANA, yeah, that would be very interesting. I would probably do that. That's a good question. Um, so how much vitamin D would you recommend a person take? <laughs> She's actually acting, asking the Ford dealer to sell you Ford. Um, no, I usually like, like you know, when things are stable, about 2,000 international units a day, D3 equivalent. But you remember, everybody is different. And in our, in our vitamin D studies, you know, for instance, the uh, young lupus patients have vitamin D levels of like five, and they'll be on the prescription vitamin D once or twice a week and every day a D3 of 5,000, you know, and, and to get their levels up. So everybody is different. It depends on the individual. But in general, you know, particularly through the COVID stuff, 2,000 days to be sort of minimum. Okay, thank you. I've heard of Plaquenil, but how does it work? And that's a nice, a good question because I don't think anybody's ever shown how it works. But it's it's inner, it's not an anti-inflammatory by itself, like high dose aspirin or naproxen. Um, I always felt like it's like the uh, has a remittive potential, and a lot of patients who were started with Plaquenil, vitamin D with say early rheumatoid arthritis, you know, often went went into remission. To me, with just the Plaquenil by itself, so it has some true uh, effect on the immune system, that, like the remittive agents would, uh, and that varies from person to person. Um, there, there are a couple of biologic agents as well. That at least we know they, uh, they work differently. Some people, they may work on different parts of the inflammatory system. So one by then responds to one, responds to another. But Plaquenil is just sort of a, an, interesting, an interesting thing. What a great observation. Um, even Michelle Petrie doesn't know how it works, but she wants you to take it for sure. But it's the only thing she felt like made a difference in the morbidity and mortality of the lupus patient over the years. Connective tissue, yeah, yeah well, I like that. Was, that was sort of our question there. Other autoimmune thyroiditis probably wouldn't do that. Haven't needed that. Um, but it's, it's a good thought. Well, you found out. You know, the one thing that happened, you know, with uh, the Plaquenil when the COVID stuff started, and the Chinese and everybody started taking it was boom. There was a shortage immediately you know, for the people that definitely needed it. Michelle Petrie was not happy. Interesting girl. Well, Denise has with one more thing to finish up our, our series. Next time we're talking about vasculitis, giant cell arteritis, temporal arteritis, things, and the things that are emerging. We're talking about gout. It's people who call it gouch because it can really hurt. And um, and then we're going to open up completely all, all various questions on rheumatology, maybe talk more about immunotherapy. Thank you, everybody, for coming. 
Um, I will have the handouts um, in the fitness center as you go in the door uh, in the little stack of papers there. Um, they will be there and the recording will be on the resident website um, in a few days as well. Um, so if you want to um, have your handouts and, and know anybody that needs those, that's where they will be. Okay. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much. Thank you.